Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's video. First, we want to tell you about a video we recently posted on our other channel. It's about hauntings that stem from disasters. It's an eerie and heartbreaking video about death and lost souls. Here's a short clip. Yeah, perhaps the strangest paranormal occurrences in the aftermath of the quake started happening to cab drivers in the region five years after the disaster. In 2016, there began reports of outbreaks of phantom passengers amongst Japanese hacks in the coastal town of Ishinumo Miki. That area had nearly been wiped off the map by a swell of seawater. 3,000 of its residents were either dead or missing. One cab driver told a researcher from Toku University they once picked up a young man in his 20s who climbed into the back seat of his cab. When the driver asked for a destination, the man simply pointed forward and said, Hiyoriyama. The driver flipped on his meter and the fare began to uptick as he drove to the man's desired location. When he got to the outskirts of the area and pulled over, he was shocked and confused to find that there was no one in his cab at all. We'll have a link to the channel and the rest of the video at the end of this video. In today's video, we're going to talk about haunting deathbed confessions. If these people really did keep these secrets, it must have taken a devastating toll on their mental health. Most of us don't have mental health problems because of deep dark secrets, but some of us do have mental health issues. For example, do you ever feel like you're not in the driver's seat of your own life? I think most of us would like to feel like we're in control of our lives. I certainly did, and I thought I did have control. But a few years ago, I realized it was all just longer chains and a bigger cage. Essentially, I just thought it was in control, but really other forces were controlling me. This led me to act in destructive and self-harmful ways because I thought sabotaging my life would somehow free me. Then I talked to a therapist and I realized self-sabotage was the absolutely wrong way to go about it. Now, I feel more in control of my life and I'm much happier. So you may not have the same problems as myself, but I know a lot of us have some issues where we could use some help. That's why I'm so thankful for our sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and it's entirely online. They have a network of over 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists who are experts in different fields so they can help with a wide array of issues. It's easy and comfortable to get started. Just answer a few questions about your needs and what you're looking for in a therapist. You do this because BetterHelp wants to match you with the right therapist. Then you talk to your therapist whatever way you feel most comfortable, whether it's over text, chat, phone, or video call. After that, you can message your therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's best for you. With BetterHelp, you can expect the same professionalism and quality you would from in-office therapy. But your therapist is custom pick, there's more schedule flexibility, and it's affordable. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash listed, and I've also linked them below in the description. Get the help you deserve and help support Criminally Listed in the process by checking out BetterHelp today. Number 3. Peter Lagerway In November 2009, 36-year-old Daniel Ames left his uncle's Adelaide, Australia shop. According to Daniel, his uncle, 68-year-old Al Ames, asked him to come over to discuss family matters. Daniel received a call the next day that his uncle had been murdered. The police ended up arresting Daniel. Surveillance footage placed him at the crime scene, which was his uncle's shop, around the time of the murder. Daniel claimed he was innocent. The police could not find the murder weapon, nor could they find a motive for Daniel to kill his uncle. But when he went to trial in November 2011, prosecutors believed that they had one. They think that Daniel killed his uncle in an altercation over methamphetamine. Allen had been involved in the meth trade. The most damaging evidence prosecutors tied to Daniel was that he claimed to be at his uncle's shop for only about 25 minutes. But surveillance footage showed him at the shop at 9.52pm and then showed him leaving around midnight. Also, the sensor light outside the shop didn't light up after he left. Had someone else come to the shop the night of the murder after he left, the light would have turned on. 
Prosecutors also pointed out that Daniel showered before he left his uncle's place. So the prosecutors asked him why he stayed in the shower. Daniel said that place was a shithole. I'd been at a filthy workshop and I wasn't going to get into bed. The judge found Daniel guilty. The judge said, in the absence of any explanation from you, I find you were connected in some way to the deceased with methamphetamines and that the murder was some way in relation to that. Daniel was sentenced to 24 years in prison for the murder of his uncle. After serving 10 years in Mobilong prison, Daniel exhausted most of his appeals. Then in 2022, after revelations from a supposed death by confession, Daniel requested another appeal in the Court of Criminal Appeal based on fresh and compelling new evidence. The confession came from another drug dealer, Peter Lagerway, who died of cancer in 2016. Lagerway claimed he had killed Al Ames. Daniel was familiar with Lagerway. They had met at the gym. Lagerway had supposedly confessed to his partner about the murder of Al Ames, and then he died two days later. Lagerway's friend, Craig Peterson, was also apparently in the hospital room and heard the confession. Pearson claimed he was in shock over the confession. It took him about five months to come forward. Pearson then tried to tell three lawyers about the confession, but none of them took him seriously. Lagerway's mother, Marie Badman, disputed Peterson's claim. She said she was in the hospital room 99.9% of the time and never heard a confession. She said her son was coming in and out of consciousness during the last couple days of his life. Lagerway's widow, whose name was kept from the press, also claimed there was no confession. If my husband had told me I would speak up, it never happened, she said. Another witness, whose name can't be revealed for legal reasons, said that Daniel and Lagerway had planned to murder Alan for his meth. But then Lagerway changed his mind and backed out. Lagerway's death by confession was not the first time the police heard Lagerway's name concerning the murder. One of the detectives who investigated the case told the court that a prison informant accused Lagerway of the crime in 2011. However, the detective did not investigate the matter further. The information about the informant's accusation was not presented to Daniel's lawyers before his trial. It also turned out that the police also failed to investigate other leads linking Lagerway to the murder of Al Names. For example, notorious criminal Ronnie Clavel told police that Lagerway was in possession of meth he stole from Al Names. Clavel died in 2014 in a 13-hour siege at a brothel. Clavel also told the police the Lagerway admitted to disposing of the murder weapon. The police did not officially record this information to protect Clavel's identity. Nor was this information presented to Daniel's defense team. As of November 2022, a decision on Daniel Ames' appeal is still pending. Ames is not seeking an acquittal, but a retrial. If his appeal fails, Daniel Ames must serve out the remainder of his 24-year sentence. Number 2. Frank Lowe Frank Lowe's family's crimes go back generations. His great-grandfather and pirate, Wicked Jack Lowe, was given land in the Bahamas by the Queen of England to stop his plundering. Like his ancestor, Frank too ventured by sea when he was young. When Frank was 10 in the early 1900s, he ran away from his father and stuck onto a boat headed for Germany. However, he eventually came back to Florida. At age 17, Frank earned his shipmaster's license. At first, he used this to ferry cattle between Florida and Cuba. In 1924, Frank started to use his expertise to smuggle alcohol during the height of Prohibition. 
Frank worked with other smugglers, such as Walter and Percy Hevelston and Dick Sawyer. The men brought suitcases of money to Havana, Cuba, and returned to Florida with alcohol. Rum running was lucrative for Frank. He also brought some notoriety. Frank once rode a Ferris wheel with Al Capone. While the public revered bootleggers, local authorities did what they could to crack down on the illegal sale of alcohol. J. H. Cox was appointed as Collier County Deputy in 1923. Cox settled into a home near Marco Island with his wife and two kids. Within a couple of months, Cox ran afoul with the local bootleggers. In 1924, Cox tried to arrest Dick Sawyer, who was with a group of bootleggers. The bootleggers beat Cox with their fists and cut him with razors. His wife intervened and this ended up saving his life. Had she not stopped the mob, they would have killed him. Seven men were arrested for the assault. Frank Lowe was one of those men. He was charged with battery. Fellow bootlegger Walter Havelston was indicted by a grand jury for attempted murder. After the meeting, Cox received many threatening letters. He wasn't intimidated, but his wife feared for their safety. Tragically, Cox would not see the man who attacked him brought to justice. On February 19, 1925, J.H. Cox, his wife, and two young children disappeared. The name of his wife and children or their ages were ever reported. Authorities extensively searched for the Cox family. A large mud hole on Marco Island was searched, but there were no signs of the Coxes. Sheriff W.R. Maynard offered a $50 reward for anyone with information on the disappearance. In an April 18, 1925 article in the Fort Myers Press, Maynard described Cox as 50 years of age, weighing 180 pounds, 5 feet 9 inches, tall, wide face, red nose, fighting gray eyes, and of a tall, slender build. But the police did not receive any tips regarding the whereabouts of the family. With Cox out of the picture, the attempted murder charges against Walter Havelston were dismissed. The charges against the other bootleggers were also dropped. J.H. Cox and his family's disappearance remained a mystery for almost 50 years until a family secret came to light in 1973. Frank Lowe, who is now 82, was near death. Since his smuggling days, Frank married twice and had nine children between two marriages. He gave up smuggling for boat building. Before he died, Frank wanted to reveal a secret. He told his son, Amos, about his involvement in the Cox family's disappearance. According to Frank, he lured Cox and his family to a ferry at Marco Island. They were soon met by Walter Havelston and his brother, Percy. Walter and Percy wanted to ensure that there were no witnesses, so they took the family to the swamp and shot them. Frank said the brothers did the shooting and he did kill the family. He said their bodies were buried seven miles north of the ferry off a road leading to Marco Island. Frank Lowe died on March 14, 1973, at age 82. Frank told Amos to keep it a secret till everyone involved in the murders was dead. Amos kept it a secret until he was on his deathbed. He gave a written account of his father's deathbed confession to his half-brother Jack. Jack spoke to the press in 1996, over 20 years after his father's death. The bodies of J.H. Cox and his family have never been recovered. By 1995, the Sheriff's Office records of the Cox family's disappearance were long lost. The Sheriff's Office decided not to reopen the case because the case details were vague and the people who were involved were no longer around. The mystery still enchants the citizens of Collier County. Not everyone believes that the Havelstons murdered the family. Percy Hevelson's children have denied the allegations. Some people believe that Cox and his family were given a one-way bus ticket out of town 
and never heard from again. It's been nearly 100 years since the Cox family went missing, and many details surrounding their disappearance remains a mystery. Number 1. Konstantinos Barkas In 1991, Carrie Needham and her son Ben moved with their parents from England to the Greek island of Kos. Carrie's parents, Edward and Christine Needham, were restoring an old farmhouse on the island. On the morning of July 24, 1991, the young mother went to her job at a nearby hotel, leaving her toddler son in the care of her parents. The grandparents let the 21-month-old run in and out of the farmhouse for most of the day. But around 2.30 p.m., they noticed Ben was missing. Initially, they assumed that Ben went to the beach with his uncle, Stephen. But when Stephen returned alone, they knew something was wrong. The family searched for him, hoping he wandered off and he was somewhere close. When they couldn't find him, they contacted the police. The police combed the area, finding no traces of the child. After a week of searching, the police extended their search by going house to house looking for any sign of Ben. At this point, the police believed that the boy had been kidnapped. Border posts were notified and television stations broadcasted information about the missing child. The police chief said, It's very strange. Everybody around here knows the baby has disappeared, but we still have no new information. Ben's father, 21-year-old Simon Ward, flew to Kos to help with the search. Carrie and Ward had an on-again, off-again relationship. In April 1991, he flew to Kos and worked as a laborer. He flew back to England the day before Ben disappeared. After a week of searching, the police brought in the army and volunteers to aid in the search. They dug up numerous sites on the island. Yet, there was no sign of the missing child. Speculation began circulating over the whereabouts of Ben. Ben's grandmother, Christine Needham, suspected he was kidnapped. The boy's father, Simon Ward, swallowed down rumors that Ben was sold to a childless couple. After a few weeks of searching, Ben's family finally left the island due to a family illness. Ben's mother, Carrie, never gave up hope and campaigned to find her son. Hundreds of sightings of Ben popped up in Greece over the preceding years. In 1995, there were reports of a six-year-old boy living with gypsies in northern Greece. However, DNA tests proved that it wasn't the missing child. There were other sightings, but DNA testing always provided the same result. In 2011, Kerry Needham asked British Prime Minister David Cameron for help. He offered help from the South Yorkshire Police and they pressed the Greek authorities to cooperate. In 2012, more than 20 years after Ben's disappearance, British police, working along Greek police and a team of specialists, conducted their first dig on the site where Ben disappeared. The investigators learned that Ben might have been accidentally run over by a construction vehicle and buried. But after a week of searching, no trace of the child was found. A second dig was ordered in 2016. The dig was initiated after the police got a lead from a supposed confession regarding Ben's death. Greek authorities questioned a person who said his friend worked as a digger operator on the day Ben disappeared. According to this person, their friend, Konstantinos Brachis, admitted to accidentally running over the child with a digger. Allegedly, Brachis was clearing a path near the family farmhouse when he thought he heard a yelp. He thought it was a dog. This was the breakthrough everyone involved in the case was waiting for. The only problem was that Brachis died of stomach cancer in 2015. Brockus' friend said he only confessed on his deathbed. Brockus' wife said that her husband was a good man and said he wasn't involved in the toddler's disappearance. 
The friend who brought the information to the police eventually stopped cooperating with them. South Yorkshire police and Greek authorities dug up two areas of land where building waste had been dumped. The team dug up 800 tons of soil, but Ben's remains were not found. 60 items were unearthed and they were all reviewed by forensic specialists. One interesting item discovered at the site was a toy car believed to have belonged to Ben. A weak DNA sample was found on the toy car. The family hoped it would be the breakthrough in the case, but it wasn't Ben's DNA. Also tested was a sandal. Strong DNA signals were found on the leather strap. The head of the forensics group said that they found a profile indicative of human blood decomposition on a fragment of the sandal. The DNA did not belong to Ben either. Nevertheless, the South Yorkshire police believed that Ben was accidentally buried in the waste. In a statement to the press, Deputy Inspector John Cousins, the officer leading the inquiry, said, It is my professional opinion that Ben Needham died as a result of an accident near the farmhouse where he was last seen playing. The search ended in October 2012. More than 30 years later, the Needham family still has trouble believing that Ben was buried in the construction waste. Carrie Needham still believes that her son is alive. In 2021, she told the Daily Mirror, I still have that hope that Yorkshire police are wrong, and while there is no evidence to show me, I have to believe he is still alive. There is not a single thread of evidence to say otherwise. She also admitted to being stuck in 1991. I never had any dreams or goals apart from finding Ben, she said. As of December 2022, no trace of Ben Needham has ever been found. If Ben is still alive, at the time of this video, he'd be 32 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.